Something happened early in the history of the Roman Republic. This is long before the rise of Gaius Marius or the Metelli. It's centuries earlier. Around 390 BC, a large band of barbarian invaders from the north poured into Italy. They were called Gauls. They were passing through Roman territory on their way south, looking for adventure. This is before Rome was a huge regional power. It was just a medium-sized city-state back then. And these Gauls decided to march against Rome and see what kind of trouble they could stir up. And the Romans send out an army, and they're crushed in a great battle. It leaves the city defenseless. And the Romans actually abandon the city, except for the sacred central citadel on the Capitoline Hill. And the Gauls pour in through the gates, unguarded, and they sack the city. A lot of senators actually stay in the town down below, and they put up a sort of nominal resistance. They're all murdered, sort of like captains going down with the ship. And one man was ultimately responsible for taking the city back, so the story goes. He was a general and a statesman who had been exiled. He was one of Rome's finest, but forced out of the city due to factional infighting. And he gathers an army together and he drives the Gauls out. His name was Camillus. There's a Plutarch biography of him. We'll get to it sometime. And the Romans slowly get back to building up their city again. But in honor of Camillus's great achievement, the Romans declare this event to be a sort of second founding of the city. And they honor Camillus with the title founder of the city. Only the second man to get that title after the mythical founding father Romulus. The third man to get that title, founder of the city, was Gaius Marius. I'm Alex Petkus, and you are listening to The Cost of Glory, where it is our mission to retell the lives of the famous Greek and Roman heroes in order to sharpen ourselves for the present. We use Plutarch as our guide. This is episode two of three of the life of Gaius Marius. Before we begin in earnest, a quick thank you to our sponsor, ideamarket.io, a very interesting new company that's revolutionizing the incentive structures around authoritative information on the internet. If that sounds good to you, do I really need to say any more for you to go check them out? Well, I will a little later anyway in the podcast. Also a personal request, if you like this show and its stories and its message, can you think of someone else you know who might appreciate it? Maybe someone who needs a little encouragement. If so, well, why hide Plutarch under a bushel? Also, you might want to sign up for our weekly philosophical emails at ancientlifecoach.com, where we go into more of Plutarch's moral takes on the world, generally through anecdotes about famous figures and events from antiquity. And now back to our show. In the last episode, we saw how, like many of Plutarch's heroes, Marius distinguished himself by his pure ability to work hard, impressing his commanders on campaign, and then later making business connections, making money in Spain. It required a lot of overtime. Was it that he was just naturally energetic? Or was it that he never let his huge ambitions out of his sight? Probably a combination of both. And you really need that kind of drive if you are going to achieve something that takes a long time to pull off. And Marius was certainly prepared to wait a long time to play the long game. He fought through the setbacks and losses at the polls, the embarrassments, and he kept stoking that resolution within himself. And he finally stepped onto the stage of history at age 50, as consul, a new man. And we saw another attribute that Marius was famous for, that is, leading by example. He was the kind of general who would wake up before everyone else and stay up later than the soldiers. And he personally made the rounds to check on the night watchmen at camp. He fought alongside the men. He ate the food they ate, at least at the times where they could see. And more generally, Marius understood the power of narrative and effective communication. He knew men were watching and that they would talk. He studied how he could shape 
the way that they would talk to his letter campaigns, his memorable anecdotes that he would share later, courting both sides of the political spectrum while he was tribune. This all showed the kind of man he was, the kind of man he wanted to be seen as. Marius was a master propagandist. To admirers of his day and to the Roman writer and historian Sallust, Marius, as he rose to power, embodied that quintessential Roman quality of virtus, where we get our word virtue. But what did virtue or virtus mean to the Romans? And was Marius really someone that we would call a good man today? Or for that matter, would Plutarch call him that? Well, let's continue on with this story. When we last left Marius, he had just finished riding a wave of popular discontent into the consulship, that is, the highest Roman magistracy. The people were frustrated with the many failures of the nobility to achieve any satisfying results in foreign wars or in improving domestic policy. And now, Marius was consul. But the Senate had already assigned the command of the war with Jugurtha to Metellus. The Senate was, as we've said, largely an advisory body, with a lot of what the Romans called auctoritas, which is informal power, influence, weightiness of opinion, auctoritas, but not a whole lot of hard constitutional authority, what we would call authority, technically. But one of their prerogatives was foreign policy. They decide which commanders would lead which wars every year. And Marius campaigned on the promise that he could end the war fast, better than Metellus. But Metellus, Marius' old commander, still has the command in Numidia. So, what does Marius have up his sleeve? He knew the rules. He knew the Senate wouldn't reassign a command for the year. It was a settled matter. And they certainly didn't feel like doing Marius any favors right now. Well, Marius now takes a very fateful step, though it didn't seem so at the time. He decides to take a page from the playbook of the Gracchi brothers. And he must have been planning this all along, by the way. Marius has been building alliances for years with those populist leaders, men who were frequent candidates for the office of tribunes of the plebs. That office, the tribunes, is the one that can call the plebiscites, the popular assemblies, and get laws passed without the Senate's permission and effectively, legally, override the will of the Senate. But the Gracchi brothers, when they were tribunes, they didn't do anything like this, that is, override the Senate in foreign policy, like Marius was thinking about doing. They didn't have themselves or anyone else voted any special military powers by plebiscite. It was only domestic policy. To use the tribunes to tamper with foreign policy, well, that would be unprecedented, legal, but quite a step up in brinkmanship. But isn't the nobility's incompetence unprecedented too? These men who are failing to capture Jugurtha, taking bribes from him, and they are failing and losing in other areas of the empire too, for that matter, because this isn't Rome's only war. Let's not even talk about the northern frontier. These jokesters have ridden into office on the reputations of glorious ancestors, these so-called optimates, the best men. Yeah, right. Everything they think they know about war, they've gotten from books. No real experience, but Marius. He's been soldiering since he could carry a sword. Who would those glorious ancestors prefer to have as their son? These corrupt weaklings or Gaius Marius. That was the story, of course. And so the tribunes call a plebiscite vote. Marius to command the war with Jugurtha. The Senate protests. The law passes. But ah, now the Senate has some power. They control the treasury. And they and Marius know that Metellus isn't as incompetent as people think. This is a hard war, and it's going to be really hard to speed up a victory against these guerrilla insurgents without some serious reinforcements. Well, 
Good luck funding that troop surge, Marius. And the Senate knows that all these foreign wars have been very unpopular with the plebs. They've stretched on over years in Spain, Greece, Asia, Gaul, now Africa. People going off and dying without any reward. There was serious discontent with the draft. Trying to raise recruits in recent years had been like squeezing water from rawhide. The Senate is expecting that Marius is now going to plummet in popularity if he tries to force conscription. But Marius gets to talking to the people, and he just exudes competence. He makes you feel like you can win if you fight for him, like you've already won, and there's excitement behind him. And then he pulls out another card. Now, Roman soldiers in those days were supposed to supply their own arms and armor. It was a volunteer citizen army, and the poor and destitute were disqualified. But Marius, again, breaks the rules. He decides to recruit them. But hadn't the Romans done this in desperate times against Pyrrhus, against Hannibal? He sends his agents out among the urban poor. He gets some interest from there. But especially he sends out to the countryside, to the poorer Italians. Many of them, maybe most, non-citizens. And he beats the bushes for new conscripts. He promises them there's enough loot in Numidia, enough gold in Jugurtha's coffers to make them all rich. And the response is overwhelming. Marius gets double the number of volunteers he was hoping for. He shows the Senate, it's not so hard to raise an army. You just need a little creativity. And so they grudgingly agree to underwrite the costs of supplying his new volunteers. They don't want to look unpatriotic. And so that was how Marius who took the consulship as the first new man to do so in some 30 years, also snatched control of the war effort out of the hands of Metellus. Metellus found out about it all in successive letters, and by the end of it, he was even more shell-shocked than the Roman Senate. And when Marius arrived in Africa with his new reinforcements, Metellus was already gone. The man who personally handed over official control of the Numidian army was a politician named Rutilius Rufus. He was a Stoic. He disapproved of all this. Marius was fine with that, because the man still did his duty. And Marius could deal with Rutilius Rufus and his growing list of disapprovers later. Rufus, by the way, a man much admired by later Stoics. He wrote a history of this period from his own perspective. It's now lost, unfortunately. So Marius got to work, sieging and capturing more towns, taking control of more land. And the dragnet was slowly closing around Jugurtha. But he kept slipping through the cracks. And the way the Romans finally got him, in the end, was by getting his friends to betray him. It all happened two long years after Marius took control of the war. And the betrayal itself, the actual handover, was overseen by a younger man that Marius had delegated the task to. And Marius knew that it was going to be an extremely delicate operation, but he was busy with other affairs and he couldn't do it himself. So he picked the most capable officer in the army that he could find to carry it out. And the kid Marius picked for the job was a good-looking, blonde-haired, blue-eyed young noble with a kind of splotchy freckliness on his pale white face that could make him somehow seem more approachable. Very clever, extremely charismatic. His name was Lucius Cornelius Sulla. At that point, Marius liked the guy. He came to Numidia the year after Marius got there as a quaestor, one of the lower-ranking junior magistracies, he brought some reinforcements. And Marius saw, this kid is ambitious. And maybe Marius saw a little bit of himself in Sulla. Not all that much, of course. Sulla was from a grand old Roman patrician family. They were in the Cornelius clan, the greatest clan of all. It was pretty large. The Scipios were in that clan. But... Sulla's little branch of it, even though he had some magistrates in his grandfather's days and older than that, 
they had declined by now. They were kind of obscure. So Sulla was, well, working his way up. And you know, considering what happened later between the two men, you have to imagine that there was some kind of genuine affection there. Because aren't the most powerful and violent enmities and hatreds usually built on some foundation of former friendship and familiarity? Well, either way, in Numidia, Marius appreciated Sulla's talent, and he gave him greater and greater tasks, and it culminated in this secret handover of Jugurtha that they were orchestrating. And the betrayer was actually the king of neighboring Mauritania, the next kingdom over further to the west, a man named Bocchus. And Bocchus, or Bacchus, well, he was an old family friend of Jugurtha, and he was hosting him, and Sulla went with a small band of troops to meet Bocchus in Mauritania. I think it's best that we save the full harrowing story for the biography of Sulla, but it was tense, and Bocchus seemed until the last moment like he was deciding whether to betray Jugurtha to Sulla or Sulla to Jugurtha. But in the end, Sulla helped convince him to make maybe not the just, but the prudent choice, and he handed over his countrymen to the Romans. With Jugurtha captured, the war was over. But all this time, Marius' mind had never been too far from the Roman domestic situation, the politics back home. He had now made some powerful enemies in the Senate, and unlike before, when he was a nobody, they now recognized him as a genuine threat. In fact, while Marius was in Africa, and the war was still in full swing, when Jugurtha was still very much at large, the optimate faction had swayed the Senate to actually declare a triumph for Metellus, an official victory parade. They found some middling siege or some battle that he won to celebrate, and they gave him the title Numidicus. Now Metellus has defeated the Numidians, they were saying. It was ridiculous. It was like they were doing it just to poke a stick in Marius' eye from across the Mediterranean. But now that Jugurtha is actually captured, Marius is already thinking about all the trouble that he's going to face back home. But then the army got more big news of trouble brewing. A huge Roman army had just been annihilated in a massive battle in Gaul. The numbers were still coming in, but it looked like it was going to be the worst defeat the Romans had suffered since Hannibal the Carthaginian inflicted a massacre on them at Cannae some 115 years ago, maybe even worse than that one. As many as 80,000 dead or captured. It happened at Arausio on the Rhone River, 105 BC, a battle we've discussed already in the life of Sertorius in more detail. The opponents were a coalition of northern European barbarians. There were two main tribes, or at least two main leaders of a coalition, at least. It was the Teutones on the one hand and the Cimbri on the other. Plutarch thinks they were Germans. Teutones is where we get the word Teutonic. And Plutarch says that in some German dialect, Cimbri meant robbers, so maybe they were Germans. But the Romans at the time considered them generally to be Gauls, Celtic peoples like most of the inhabitants of modern-day France at that time, a region which they called Gaul. And the Romans, of course, had a long history with the Gauls. It went back some 300 years to the days of the great Camillus, who recaptured the city of Rome after the Gauls had sacked it in 390 BC. Since then, and until only very recently, the Romans had felt more or less in control of the Gallic situation on their borders. There were various tribes in Spain and France and even northern Italy in Cisalpine Gaul, as they called it. Many of them allied. These Gauls, many of them you could work with, speak Latin with or Greek, trade, they'd ally with you. But the further you got from the Roman borders and... In the region of France, the Roman territory was really just the strip along the coastline of the south, the Mediterranean coast. The further you got from that, the wilder the Gauls seemed. 
And there had been troubles for a few years now. The Kimbri and the Teutones were kicked up like a tsunami wave from some obscure war deep in the wild north. And now they were crashing against the Roman shores. There had been a series of bungled military operations against them. Several consuls had been killed. And you know, Marius would have learned since coming to the city how the stories of the sack of Rome in 390 were really part of the fabric of Roman historical consciousness. There were little reminders in the place names and monuments around town that brought the stories about the event to mind. Here's where so-and-so stood up to the chieftain Brennus, and here's where they threw off so-and-so from the cliff of the Capitoline to his death, and here's the temple Camillus founded, and that kind of thing. Marius understood the psychology of all this for the Romans, how all these little reminders seemed to communicate to them. They must never forget that Rome is not invincible. And now, all that tradition and history and legend suddenly burst into the present at the Battle of Arausio. The city was in a panic. There were reportedly 300,000 Gallic fighting men, bringing along also their women and children in wagons with them. And the path to Rome was now wide open to them. Marius sizes up the situation. He's doing all this by correspondence, by the way, through his associates and agents in Rome. And he sees another opening. This battle of Arausio, and in fact the whole series of operations that the Romans had been conducting against the Cimbri, it all fit into the narrative of an incompetent nobility that Marius had been spinning in his political campaigns. And by God, wasn't he right? The Romans should have won at Rousio, but two noblemen were bickering over who should lead the army, and the Cimbri exploited their divisions to annihilate them. And you know what? If Gaius Marius had been in charge of the war effort, they would have won a long time ago. There wouldn't even have been a battle of Rousio. He could circulate that story now that he had captured Jugurtha. So yes, Rousio was a great tragedy and all, Rome's finest cut down, and all that. But Marius maybe secretly thanked the gods for his own good fortune, his timing. Because, again, nobody becomes the greatest Roman in times of peace. So, he has his agents get to work. And by the end of the year, the same year he captured Jugurtha, the same year of the Battle of Arausio, Marius gets elected to the consulship by what seemed like a grassroots groundswell of support among the Roman people, and of course, supported by the business classes, in a way that completely smashes precedent once again. The candidate was elected in absentia. That was unheard of. You were supposed to be present in Rome to run. For that matter, you were also supposed to wait 10 years between successive consulships. But obviously, these were extraordinary times. So, Marius ties up a few loose ends in Numidia, and he sails back to Rome. He brings some of his soldiers home with him, and together they celebrate their triumph, and they parade the once proud Jugurtha through the streets of the city in chains. What a specimen. And on that one sweet day, As he was celebrated in songs and speeches and prayers and sacrifices to gods, nobody could doubt that Gaius Marius was a great man. But was he the greatest? Of course, he had another war to fight. But this war wasn't the only problem that he had to solve if Marius was going to stay on top. When he ran for his first consulship, and when he was vying for command of the war in Africa, when he was trying to recruit volunteers from the poor of Rome and Italy, he ran on big promises. He was going to make these men rich. Of course, there had been plenty of plunder when they captured cities in Numidia, plenty of loot to extract from the locals, shiny objects, livestock, slaves, and Jugurtha's coffers. But these are all movable goods. And movable goods are easy for a Roman general to distribute on the spot as he pleases. 
But everyone knows that's not how serious men build real wealth. That's not how you build a reputation, a legacy. For that, you need land, a permanent source of income. But land captured in war, well, a general doesn't have the right to distribute that. It's the property of the Roman people, ager publicus, public land. And it's the republic that decides what to do with this land. Usually, that meant the Senate. So, how was Marius going to reward his men properly? Especially some of these poor, landless men who had put so much faith in him. But also all the others. Everyone had risked their lives for their commander. And many were at retirement age now. The bill was going to be coming due soon. And Marius knew... If the reports about the size of the invasion force of the Cimbri and Teutones were anything close to the truth, he might end up needing a lot more soldiers. And he also had to leave a security force in Africa. How was he going to recruit more men if he had a reputation for lagging on fulfilling his promises? Soldiers talk. Well, one day, as Marius was busy making arrangements for what was to be done in his absence... A young man shows up at his door in Rome. Smart kid, from a good family. He has a heart for the people, he explains. Big fan of Gaius Marius. Go on. Big admirer of the Gracchi and all they stood for. He's heard Marius met them. Yes. Well, the young man's name was Saturninus. Lucius Apuleius Saturninus. Turns out he had hit a sort of dead end in his career... He was a great speaker, ambitious, got himself elected quaestor. But somehow, when he was working as superintendent at the Roman docks, down at the port at Ostia, well, he did some things that, you know, annoyed the wrong people in the Senate, some optimates, and they managed to strip him of all his duties, everything except his title. Yes, Marius had heard about that. It was a shame. Well, Saturninus now wanted to run for Tribune of the Plebs. The way he saw it, he and Marius had common enemies. The conservatives in the Senate, the optimates, obstructionists, standing in the way of progress. Yes, he didn't need to say any more. Well, Saturninus was eager to do Marius a favor, and if Marius could help him get elected Tribune, he would be in a very good position to help Marius out. He would be very eager to help out Marius's veteran soldiers, in particular, who wanted to retire to a nice plot of Roman public land. And so Marius made an alliance. Maybe he saw a little bit of Gaius Gracchus in the kid. Marius taps a few of his political contacts in the city, has a few late-night meetings, and then he sets off north for Gaul at the head of his army, and Saturninus gets elected as one of the tribunes of the plebs for the next year. Marius' new army arrives in Gaul to find that the Cimbri and the Teutones had, for some reason, directed their raiding operations towards Spain instead of Italy. That was fortunate. It gave Marius time to get his new troops ready because many of these men were new recruits from the poorer classes. Just yesterday, they were pulling a wagon or washing clothes in a fuller's shop. He gets them building things together, constructing forts, digging canals. He drills them in weaponry, toughens them up by getting them to carry their own packs instead of having animals or slaves do it. They come to be known as Marius's mules, and the men would often see him nearby carrying loads with them, putting his hand to the shovel. He was in his element, leading by example. Marius also saw that part of the Romans' problem was that they were fighting these northern barbarians with outdated military formations. Their battle lines were clunky and inflexible. They were brittle, and the Cimbri had figured out how to snap them easily. So Marius divides up the army into legions of around 4,000 men, and divides up the legions into 10 cohorts of 400 each. He wants these smaller cohorts to become the vertebrae 
of his army. Rock solid on their own, but flexible when they work together. And he divides the cohorts further down into smaller units called centuries, and he declares that their leaders, who were called centurions, are to become professional soldiers. He only wants the best men in these spots, lifers, and they were going to be rewarded handsomely. Marius also makes innovations in their equipment. Marius's reforms, by the way, are widely believed to have changed the course of Roman history in some unexpected ways. More on that in the comparison and analysis episode. So Marius also makes innovations in the soldiers' equipment. For example, the military standards that they used to carry around before Marius, well, each legion used to stick a different animal figure on the standard poles that they carried around. Wolves, horses, minotaurs, pigs. But now, and in fact, forever thereafter, the Roman army would be known by one single standard animal on all their insignia, the bird of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, the eagle. And before battle, they used to throw these javelins at the enemy, called the pilum, and Marius makes a little adjustment. Where the wood spear shaft connected to the iron tip, he makes one of the pegs holding them together wood instead of metal. There's a wood peg and a metal peg, and the wood peg will break when the javelin impacts, say, in an enemy soldier's body or in his shield, and it would stick in its target, and then the shaft would stay attached by the metal peg, but then it would bend down awkwardly because the wood peg would break, and it would hamper the man or make his shield useless, and you also couldn't reuse the spear. Marius knew it's often the little things that add up to make a big difference. But the Cimbri were nowhere to be found near the Roman borders, and after a year of campaigning, Marius's term as consul was approaching its end, and so he made sure that Rome was overwhelmed with letters home from soldiers singing his praises. According to Plutarch, it was Marius' extraordinary reputation for justice in arbitrating disputes that really stood out. He even sided against a relative of his in a capital case involving some soldiers. And so, once again, Marius just steamrolling over precedent. He gets elected for a third consulship, his second in a row, in absentia, for the year 103 BC. And soon he gets some encouraging news to share with the soldiers, too. His investment in that ambitious young tribune, Saturninus, was starting to pay off. Saturninus passed a plebiscite vote to distribute conquered lands in Africa to Marius's veterans from the Numidian campaign. The soldiers are elated. Marius takes care of his mules. But still the barbarians are nowhere to be found near the borders of Roman territories in the south of France. And it was around this time that Marius was approached by a certain young man of equestrian rank, a kid who had scarcely cleared 20 years old, but powerfully built, a Sabine, one of those tough mountain people. He had survived the Battle of Arausio, one of the very few who did. He swam across the Rhone to safety in his full armor with his shield. And now he'd learned the Gallic language and was volunteering to go into hostile territory on a spy mission. His name was Sertorius. Impressive kid. Marius sent him off with some supplies. And maybe, maybe it was even Sertorius himself who brought back the news that the Cimbri were finally on the march again, bearing down on the Roman frontier. But the year was coming to an end, and Marius still hadn't achieved his victory. It was time to make another bid for the consulship. But even Marius can see that he's stretching this crisis to its breaking point in the political game, because every year he gets elected means one more jilted optimate, some senator's son, joins the group who want to take him down, get him out of the way. Marius leaves the army and goes home personally this time to Rome. And he has a great excuse. His colleague in office had died, and the elections for next year's consul 
have to be overseen by one of this year's consuls, and he's the only one. And this time, he doesn't even put his name on the ballot. At first. See, he and Saturninus have a little show planned. So one day there's this big public assembly. Marius is in the audience, and Saturninus is speaking to the crowd. And Saturninus urges the people, they must elect Gaius Marius. Eyes turn to Marius. Marius waves them away. No, no, no. And Saturninus says, Marius is a traitor to his country if he refuses the command of the armies in times of such peril. No, no, no. But the crowd shouts louder. And Saturninus was really hamming it up that day. It was kind of obvious. But it worked. And Marius reluctantly concedes to run for a fourth consulate in the very election he was going to preside over as consul. The crowd erupts in cheers. And this mix of fear from impending doom and exultation from the hopes staked on a glorious leader, it all explodes into the city with unstoppable energy. Absolutely absurd thought the nobles, but they didn't dare try to block it. However, Marius then reaches out to them, and he actually helps the Optimates get one of their own men elected, too, as his colleague, a man named Quintus Lutatius Catullus. Well, hopefully they can bury the hatchet, because now the intelligence coming in about the barbarians is truly disturbing. The Cimbri and the Teutones have decided to divide up their massive 300,000 strong forces into two separate trains headed for Roman territory. The Teutones are planning to come through southern Gaul along the coast and in through Liguria in northwest Italy. The other army led by the Cimbri was coming all the way around the Alps from the far north through Noricum, which is modern day Austria. It was a giant pincer movement, locking in on Italy. Hi folks, we'll get back to the story in just a second. A quick thanks to our sponsor though, ideamarket.io. Idea Market is an innovative new internet application designed to radically shift the incentive structures around quality information on the internet. They have a creative way You can, I'm paraphrasing here, place bets with real money on quality sources of information on the internet in a decentralized way without the use of your usual trusted third parties like, say, corporate media outlets. And they are using blockchain technology to pull it all off. It's very interesting and exciting, and they are working on solving a real serious problem for sure. Check out ideamarket.io to find out more. You can read their white paper there and see how you can start playing around. Or check the link in the show notes for that. Catalyst, the other consul, takes an army to guard the northern passage. And Marius goes back to southern Gaul to try to stop the Teutones from getting into Liguria. And he concentrates his forces in the area of Aquae Sextiae, which is modern-day Aix-en-Provence, which is very close to Massilia, that's modern-day Marseille, along the French Riviera. And Marius has his troops build a fort, the way that only Romans could do. They throw up a massive stronghold of earthwork and timber in a day or two. And their fort is sitting on a little hill overlooking the plain when the giant force of the Teutones comes through. Marius thought this would be a good place to guard the passage along the coast through to Liguria. And so when the Teutones got there, what Marius would do was send these fresh new Roman soldiers up on sentry duty so they could look over the timber palisade walls and have a clear view of a massive 100,000 plus strong sea of barbarians with their wagons and their families and their strange hairstyles and their animal skin garments. 
And these were the men, one division in particular, an elite band called the Ambrones. These were the guys that were widely credited with the victory at Arausio, the very men responsible for the slaughter or enslavement of 80,000 Romans. It was terrifying, but this was exactly what Marius wanted them to see. The Teutones would send warrior bands up to the walls to taunt the Romans, shout their rhythmic battle chants, call them down to fight like men. But Marius refused. And this keeps going on over a number of days until, gradually, the Roman troops watching these hoary Nordic wild men get a little bored. They even start to get annoyed at them for disturbing their peace. They start to see these shouts and war dances as ridiculous histrionics. And they start getting annoyed even at Marius for not sending them out to teach these Gauls a lesson. He hears complaints. Good. That's just where he wants them. But he keeps them waiting. And so they wouldn't think that he was a coward or catch on to his psychological game he produces a prophetess. Her name was Martha. She was a Syrian woman who had been making the rounds in Rome recently, telling fortunes, predicting future events. She was very good at her craft. She had predicted the results of some gladiatorial matches, made some gambling people a lot of money, and she'd even tried to get an audience with the Senate, and she was turned down for that, but... This Martha found her way into the houses, anyway, of the nobles through their wives. Marius' wife, Julia, again the aunt of Julius Caesar, she saw that this could be a very useful woman indeed for her husband. So she sent the prophetess Martha to him in Gaul. And Marius gave her a place of honor in the camp. He let her go around, carried in a litter, and with her purple robe on and her clasp and her ritual spear and her wreaths and chaplets. And Martha really knew her role. And she was seen a lot these days, making sacrifices, looking up at the skies, meaningfully, down at the earth. And Marius kept saying, My men, I really do want to go out and crush those Gauls, but you see, it's not the gods' will right now. Don't worry, they'll give us a sign. And his troops all knew Marius was a very religious man. And eventually, the Teutones get fed up with the waiting, and they lay siege to the Roman fort. They make several attacks, but the Romans fight them off. They kill a bunch of them with arrows and sling stones, and the barbarians finally decide to move on. And as they are passing on, some of them get close to the fort, and they pass by and they ask, Would the Romans like them to carry any messages to their wives in Rome? The Teutones would be with them very soon, after all. And now, once they are a little ways ahead, Marius finally breaks camp. He follows them. The omens are propitious now. And when they get a little further down the valley, Marius camps on some favorable ground. Again, he takes the heights. The Teutones and the Ambrones and the rest of the group are down by the river. And somehow, there, down the valley, near Aquae Sextii, an engagement starts. It's after the barbarians have eaten and gotten a little drunk. Marius lets some of the troops go down and fetch water by the stream, right by them. It's a provocation. And the Ambrones, the elite band, they take the bait and they start fighting. It's chaotic at first, but then the foe quickly locks into an ordered formation, and the fighting escalates into a battle proper. Marius sends a division of reinforcements who are just champing at the bit to fight those invaders. It's led by a group of native Ligurians, northwest Italians. They're defending their own homeland. And the Romans end up inflicting heavy losses before the day closes, They rout this section of the army that came up to attack them on their water supply mission. It's not a decisive victory, but it was enough to make the Teutones very angry, which was, again, right where Marius wanted them to be. He knew their leaders were now under immense pressure to retaliate. 
So he set up the pieces on the board. Now, the next day, they bury their dead and started making preparations for battle. And later in the evening on that day, Marius secretly sends a band of 3,000 heavy infantry around the side to a position in a nearby forest that bordered on the plain, led by a guy named Marcellus. And the next morning, Marius marches his troops toward the plain, and they stop on an incline, facing downhill toward the enemy. He sends cavalry down in front of the Gauls' camp just to provoke them. And again, they take the bait. The barbarians charge uphill, and Marius hurls javelins, and he digs in. The Teutones and the Ambrones slam into Marius' lines. Their superior in numbers, even superior in physical strength and experience, these are veteran warriors, the victors of Arausio. But Marius has the uphill advantage. He presses back down on them, and his officers have their troops shoved with everything they've got and the Gauls are on uneven and unstable ground. And Marius waits till they've pushed them back down into the plain and the flat, and exhausted them, and the Gauls fall back, and they form up for another charge, this time on equal footing, and they engage again. But right at that moment, Marcellus comes up in a surprise attack at their rear with his commandos, and a terror overtakes the exhausted Teutones and Ambrones, and their lines break and melt into a panic. And what followed after that was gruesome. Marius led his men, fully avenged the lost army of Arausio, and all their countrymen who had died in many battles prior to that over the years. And such reports as we have put the number of dead or captured at the great battle of Aquae Sextii at some hundred thousand men. And here's what Plutarch says about what happened next. After the battle, Marius collected such of the arms and spoils of the barbarians as were handsome and tire and fitted to make a show in his triumphal procession, all the rest he heaped on a huge pyre and arranged for a magnificent sacrifice. The soldiers had taken their stand about the pyre in arms with wreaths on their heads, and Marius himself, having put his purple bordered robe on and girded about him, as the custom was, had taken a lighted torch, held it up towards heaven with both hands, and was just about to set fire to the pyre, when some friends were seen riding swiftly towards him, and there was a deep silence and expectancy on the part of all. But when the horsemen were near, they leaped to the ground and greeted Marius, bringing him the glad news that he had been elected consul for the fifth time and handing him letters to that effect. The soldiers, transported with delight, sent forth a universal shout, accompanied by the clash and clatter of their arms, and after all his officers had crowned Marius afresh with wreaths of bay, he set fire to the pyre and completed the sacrifice. It was the greatest day of Marius' life. The Teutones were defeated, but the Cimbri were now pouring through Noricum in the Northern Alps, probably amassing a nice war chest of the famous Noricum steel blades on their way to Italy. But the problem for Marius was not so much the Cimbri, it was the question of who was going to defeat the Cimbri. Because the man currently leading the Roman forces against the Cimbri, that is, his colleague in the consulship, Catullus, was a member of the faction in the Senate that was opposed to everything that Marius stood for. And perhaps already by that point, Catullus had given some signs that he didn't intend to return Marius any favors for helping him get elected. But then there was also the troubling matter of what happened with Sulla. Sulla, that talented young man who had orchestrated the betrayal of Jugurtha, 
While Marius had entrusted him with other sensitive missions in the Teutonic campaign, he captured a major chieftain of theirs, he persuaded some of their allies to join the Roman cause. But Sulla was, how do you say it, a little too good. He seemed at times like he almost upstaged Marius. Ridiculous, of course. That was impossible. But Sulla seemed like he didn't mind if he did. And Marius made his disapproval clear. But instead of piping down and stepping out of the torchlight, Sulla left, and he went and joined Catalus's army. It was obvious why. Catalus. Ah, Catalus. If Sulla made Marius look worse, well, Catalus was the sort of man who actually needed someone like Sulla around to make him look better. And Marius had heard that Sulla was just shining in Catalus's retinue, scoring victories, achieving feats. And Sulla's sympathies were more with the Optimates anyway. He was from one of those blue blood families. If an old money noble like Catalus defeated the Kimbri on his own, and who knows, with Sulla on his team, maybe Catalus actually stood a chance, then the Optimates would have a powerful counterblast to Marius' usual narrative. It was dangerous. But soon he gets some encouraging news. The Kimbri have defeated Catalus' army in two successive battles, first in the Alps near Trent in northern Italy. It was called Tridentum back then. And then further down the Adige River towards the rich plains in the wide Po River Valley. Catalus has retreated all the way to Rome to regroup. Poor guy. His story was actually that his troops mutinied and fled against his wishes, and that he decided he had more regard for their reputation than for his own, and so he rode to the front of them and led them so as to make it look like a tactical retreat. That was the story, at least. While Marius returned home to Rome to be officially reinstated as consul and take care of some business, but everyone thought that he would celebrate a triumph and do an official parade for his Teutonic victory. However, he refused to do that while the state was still in such danger. Plus, it would make Catalyst look very bad, and he didn't want to escalate their rivalry, which was already tense. So the two commanders set off north together. Marius tries to encourage Catalus. They were in this together, for the good of Rome. And he summons his army from Gaul to come to northern Italy, where the foe is. Once he's in the territory, he tries to draw the Cimbri into a battle. But they keep refusing. It's like they were waiting for something, or someone and so when ambassadors come from the Kimbri to Marius' camp, he admits them with great curiosity. In their meeting then, the ambassadors open by demanding land for themselves and for their brethren, and enough cities to dwell in. And Marius asks the ambassadors, What do you mean when you say you're brethren? And they respond that they meant the Teutones, of course. Maybe they hadn't heard the news. Or perhaps they had, but thought it was a trick. But the Roman officers standing there burst into laughter. And Marius replies, Well, there's no need to worry about your brethren. They have land now. And the land that they received from us, why, they will have it forever. The Kimbri ambassadors understand his sarcasm. They spit and curse him. He was going to pay for his insult at the hands of the Kimbri now and the Teutones once they arrived too. Ah, he says, but don't you know the Teutones are already here? And he produces for them two of the chieftains of the Teutones who fled from the battle at Aquae Sextii but were captured by the Sequani, Roman allies, and handed over. They're in chains. The Kimbri leave in a rage and start preparing for battle. And so the armies meet in the flat plains, midway between modern-day Milan and Turin, near a town called Vercelli, or Vercelli today. 
and the forces assembled were massive. The Romans were outnumbered again. According to their own reports, Catalyst was commanding around 20,000 troops. Marius had brought around 30,000. But the Cimbri and their allies, so we are told, were mustering as much as 150,000 fighters. However, in the Romans' favor, the men they were fighting, northern Gauls, or maybe Nordsmen, or maybe Germans, whatever they were, they were more tolerant of extreme cold than extreme heat. And it was the dead of summer in August, which can be punishingly hot in northern Italy. Another factor is the dust in this dry season of summer. When the armies engaged, the Cimbri deployed an incredible 15,000 cavalry, and the Romans had a decent number of their own as well, and this kicked up a huge cloud of dust, which actually, according to Plutarch, helped the Roman soldiers because it made it hard to realize just how vast an army they were fighting. And the details of the battle are, for that reason, somewhat confused. And by all accounts, it was hard even for people there to determine what exactly was going on in the thick of it. But by the end of the day, when the dust settled, it was clear the Romans had won another upset victory against a superior foe. It was a rout, in fact. They took some 60,000 prisoners. And the reports say that there were twice as many Cimbri as that that were slain. Many of these proud people committed suicide rather than allow themselves to be taken as slaves, including the women. But even on the very day of battle, contentions started to arise. Which of the generals was more responsible for the victory? Marius had been commanding the wings, Catalus the center of the lines. So which had actually dealt the key blows to the Gauls? Everyone knew the answer to that question would have serious political ramifications back home. It was about who was really a credible leader. They even call in arbiters from a nearby city. Catalyst, I guess, anticipated all this. Before the battle, he made his soldiers cut his name into their throwing javelins so that you could see whose spears killed who. But by the end of the whole debacle, Marius was the one who got the credit back home for the Battle of Vercelli. And when they returned to the city, the tribunes held a plebiscite vote, and the people of Rome declared Marius, third founder of the city, after Romulus and Camillus. It seemed a little bit on the grand side to some people. That title implied that these Gauls were a bigger threat than Hannibal, because none of the generals in the Second Punic War had gotten that title. Hmm. Well, why not? And now the people in the assemblies are clamoring for Marius to celebrate a triumph all alone for both victories. But he refuses. Whatever he thought of Catalyst or his competence, now that Marius had experienced such amazing fortune, he wanted to show everyone, including the Senate, that he was a man of moderation. And so he proposes that he and Catalyst celebrate a dual triumph parade together, ride through the streets as joint victors over the Cimbri and Teutones. It was unusual, but he insisted. So they did. And yet, after they swept all the confetti and rice off the streets and everyone dispersed to their homes, Marius was left with a huge political problem to solve. And it's a new kind of problem for Rome, because these poor, landless men that Marius recruited, well, Rome can't just let these men who had just saved the city go back to being potters and wagoneers. Marius has set a precedent, and he can't stop the train now. They need land. But this time around, it might be even harder to pull off. Marius is starting to sense that his enemies are already busy undermining him. For example, he gets word of alternative facts circulating about what happened at the Battle of Vercelli. Well, you know, all the main fighting was really done in the center. Catalyst bore the brunt of the fighting. It was Catalyst who was really responsible for the victory. Marius deliberately arranged the battle formation so that he could take all the credit. Marius had been malicious to Catalyst. But hadn't they found Catalyst's javelins lying among the elite fighters of the Cimbri? 
Some of this smelled like Sulla, that clever young former protege. And then Marius, you know, he was never really personally one for the Greek literature like those fancy boys, but all the same, he knows his audience and he likes to appeal to the tastemakers. And he finds a Greek poet, a guy named Archias, to write up a little commemorative poem, the epic tale of Gaius Marius battling the Gauls, something for those dinner parties. And it seems like that little venture is going well, but then Arceus stops coming by. He starts having these excuses. What's going on? Well, Marius eventually finds out that Arceus is being courted by Catalus to celebrate his victory instead. And Arceus also starts getting seen around the house of Metellus, his old commander. Oh, that's right. Metellus Numidicus now, yes. Now, Metellus has already been working against Marius in domestic politics. A few years ago, he actually tried to block Marius' young tribune friend Saturninus from passing that law granting land to the veterans from the Africa campaign. Well, that failed. But then, Metellus got elected to the office of censor. Only the most respectable men, senior statesmen, got to be censor. As censor, Metellus tried to get Saturninus expelled from the Senate for licentious behavior. Because Roman censors could actually do that. Well, that failed too. But Metellus and his Optimates faction, they're more determined than ever to block Marius and his massive veteran patronage scheme. So Marius decides that he has little alternative but to get some serious authority behind him and run for consul again, a sixth time, the fifth in a row. This time, though, Metellus is running against him. So in order to win, Marius, well, he has to compromise himself more than ever. He has to play the populace to pander to the people's basest inclinations, chasing their cheers, fearing their boos. And Plutarch points out that this was really out of character for Marius, because he was not deep down, a man with a heart for the plebs. He was much more at home among the soldiers out on campaign, barking out orders to crowds of men who were standing at attention. In order to win and to make up for his discomfort and awkwardness in peacetime populism, Marius leans heavily on Saturninus. Thankfully, he also has his soldiers in town voting, the citizens among them at least, And he still had that business class support. So in the elections for the magistrates for the year 100 BC, not only does Marius defeat Metellus for the consulship, but he even gets one of his own buddies elected as co-consul. And yes, there was old Rutilius Rufus, the Stoic, the Optimate, going around sounding the alarm about bribery. Well, if he wants, let him lodge a prosecution, produce some evidence maybe. He didn't. But even if there were a few irregularities, again, where's the evidence? Well, surely it was in Rome's best interest to reward its defenders. And that was all Marius really wanted to see through. Well, Metellus was beaten back on one front, but he was still powerful. And now he was going to do everything he could to stop Marius's agenda. Still, Marius didn't hate the old fool. He took a conciliatory approach to Metellus. They had to live together in the same city, in the same Senate, after all, didn't they? Or did they? Saturninus comes to Marius with an idea one day, and he brings along with him another populist friend named Glaucia, one of the praetors for the year. Metellus had Tried to expel Glaucia from the Senate, too, like he had Saturninus. Licentious behavior, once again. But both of these reprobates actually did hate Metellus. And they have a plan to make sure both that Marius's troops get their land and that Metellus never gets in their way again. Marius hears them out. The plan was clever and also a little bit wicked. But he agrees to it. The stakes are just too high. 
It's a shame that a decent man like Metellus has to stand in the way of progress. And here's how it went down. Saturninus, as tribune, proposes a law to the people's assembly. The Cimbrian Teutones had captured large tracts of land in Gaul, taken them from their previous owners by force, and then the Romans had defeated the Cimbri and Teutones, and now they considered those tracts of land their own, conveniently. Saturninus proposes a massive distribution of these lands to Marius' veterans. And he adds a key clause. The distribution law requires every member of the Senate to swear an oath within five days to uphold this law. Any senator who refuses to swear this oath to uphold the law, which is not at all a common sort of addendum to Roman laws, by the way, well, anyone who refuses is to be expelled from the Senate and forced to pay a huge fine. The Optimates are incensed, but not just them. Really, the whole Senate is appalled. This is unheard of. It's not just the extraordinary and demagogic land handout. It's the disrespect, the arrogance. But maybe this disrespect was calculated. On the day of voting, there's a riot. Actually, this legislation wasn't all that eagerly received among the urban poor. Many of these people had decided that they did not have the leisure to go fight in a foreign war when the opportunity presented itself. And now, as the senators wasted no time in pointing out to them, there are all these strange foreigner Italian peasants filling their city, many of whom are not even citizens. And a lot of these people are about to get life-changing wealth dumped on them from above in return for just marching around Gaul for a couple of years. So there's a riot on the day of voting. But Saturninus and Glaucia managed to push the law through in a plebiscite. So now, the clock is ticking. The Senate has just five days to formally swear to uphold the law, or else. All this time, though, Marius and Saturninus have actually kept their distance in public. And Marius now steps up to play his role. He's been seen around town, shaking his head in disapproval whenever this law has been brought up. And now he gives a speech in the Senate. Marius refuses to swear this oath. Even though it would benefit his own soldiers, the august dignity of the Roman Senate simply must not allow itself to be questioned in so brazen a manner. He would not swear the oath. And now, as if on cue, Metellus speaks up in the Senate. He's surprised to find himself agreeing with Gaius Marius. Metellus rails against the law and the abuses of these demagogic tribunes of the plebs, and he assures his colleagues that he would never swear such an oath. So Metellus took the bait. And five days later, in the late afternoon, on the day that the new law stipulated the senators had to swear the oath, Marius calls a meeting of the Senate. The consuls are, again, responsible for summoning the Senate. He looks nervous. He points out to the Senate, the city is still packed with angry soldiers, and Saturninus and Glaucia are riling up the crowds and getting ready for a riot, it looks like. They are dangerous men, he tells his colleagues. Marius explains, he sees a way out for the Senate. They can all go and swear an oath to uphold the law insofar as it is a law, you know, kind of like crossing their fingers. And then once these country rabble disperse, the Senate can raise some constitutional objections. Uh, the law was passed by violence and so on. It's not a real law. It'll be easy to nullify this. Here, he says, I'll be the first to swear. And as the Senate watches, stunned, Marius, without hesitating, amidst the protests, marches out of the Senate house to the temple of Saturn, to the designated place, and he swears the oath. The afternoon is turning to evening. There's a crowd of thugs outside in the forum, many of them looking very tough war veterans, 
Saturninus and Glaucia are standing there with them, watching, and the senators have no time to debate. And every last one of them, fearing for the safety of the city and for their own safety, goes and swears the oath. Except Metellus. He was a principled man. He had made his stance clear to the Senate, to the entire city, five days ago. How could a man like Metellus change his stance at a moment's notice on the grounds of some deceptive legal chicanery? His friends pleaded with him to take the oath, but he is said to have replied, any man can do the right thing when there is no risk present, but a good man acts honorably in the face of danger. Marius thought he might say something like that. Well, the next day, Saturninus called another plebiscite. He told the veterans that they would not get their land as long as Metellus remained in the city. And now he has broken a law of the people of which he knew the consequence when Saturninus gets the assembly to pass a decree of exile against Metellus. Crowds of supporters come to Metellus's side at the news of this, many of them openly carrying daggers against the law barring weapons in the city limits. Metellus calls them off. He would not have blood spilled and faction raised on his account. Perhaps someday the people would change their minds and call him back. If not, it was better for him not to be there. What went on in Marius's mind as he watched all this unfold, as he actively brought about the ruin of his old commander, as the whole city watched? What course had brought Marius to this point? He had wanted most of all to join the elites, but now one of the best men in the Senate had become an intractable opponent of him and everything he stood for. The optimates were humbled, for now, and Marius had made good on his promises to his soldiers. He had saved the Republic, hadn't he, and honored its defenders with a fitting recompense. Now, however, a little domestic success was really starting to get to the heads of Saturninus and Glaucia. They were exhilarated and spinning out of control. Saturninus had already had a rival candidate for the Tribunate murdered. That guy was going to be a toady of the Optimates. Everyone knew it. And Saturninus had, again, barely bothered to cover up his tracks. But nobody dared prosecute. Even though to all appearances, Marius was sitting at the top of the Roman hierarchy, he was now starting to get out of his element in domestic politics. Could he right this ship? Where was it even sailing to now? Certainly these were uncharted waters. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, please be so kind as to leave us a positive review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. It really helps other people to find this stuff. And stay tuned for next week's episode, the conclusion of the life of Gaius Marius. Stay strong. Stay ancient. This is Alex Betkus. Mm-hmm.